I used to I used to think that I could save the world with technology. And when I was 18, I had the chance to put that faith into practice. I flew to Bolivia with a team from Engineers Without Borders, and we were working on a rural road that got washed out every year with the rains. And the technologies we were implementing were decidedly low tech, you know, ditches and rockeries, things you might do in your backyard. And before we left, we had carefully considered every single technical detail, from the hydrology and geology of the region, to the exact dimensions of the optimal ditch for open channel flow. But we forgot to consider the most obvious question. Why did we have to go? Why couldn't the Bolivians take care of their own road? That question quickly grew from a sort of passing curiosity while I was wiping the sweat from my brow to a full-blown obsession. And what I learned was deeply uncomfortable. And my engineering indoctrination afforded me no preparation for what I uncovered. You see, I learned that Bolivia had been impoverished and its people rendered unable to fix a road by the West. From the 16th to the 19th centuries, Spanish colonists extracted 40,000 tons of silver. And just before the Spanish came, these people were building some of the most durable roads in human history. And that silver, if you sold it today, would be worth 20 billion dollars. And we didn't even talk about inflation. That's twice the national debt of Bolivia today. If you think about the human cost, if you put all the bodies that came out of those mines and laid them head to toe, you could have built a bridge to Spain from Bolivia. So after that great start to your independence, Imagine the 1980s, the US-backed government radically slashed spending on public services, on things like road maintenance, of all things, in order to push down inflation and pay back Western creditors. So the reason why Bolivia couldn't fix a simple dirt road today, I realized, had everything to do with politics, not a lack of technology. They didn't need Western saviors and hard hats. And when I went back and kept learning more, I realized that global poverty is a political problem. It's not a technological one. Even a quick look at the balance sheet shows us this simple fact. It's not the, that the West is aiding the rest, as we might like to think. It's the rest who are aiding the West. From 2002 to 2007, even after accounting for all the aid that we do generously give, the Global South, the developing world, sent back to us $2.6 trillion. So understanding that big picture, I realized that maybe a road, you know, might help some people out in the short term to get to the schools, to get to clinics. That's real. But in the long term, a smattering of technologies here and there was never going to undo, was never going to fight an unjust political order. It could not fix those problems. So, when I, when I'm a civil engineer. I was trained and I've worked as a civil engineer, but I have realized that technology will not solve our biggest problems. And our faith, deep down that it will, is distracting us from what really matters, which is that, that P word, politics. So, you know, when I think about some of the other you know, biggest crises we face today, things like climate change. You know, when I went back to Bolivia in, in two years ago, I trekked up to the top of Chacaltaya Glacier, and I realized that Chacaltaya was nothing but barren rock 
where the ice once stood. Chakaltaya is part of a system of glaciers that provide clean water to millions of people in the Andes. And so obviously, this is one of our big problems, like, clim like climate change, like poverty. And what are we going to do about that? People like te techno evangelists, like Bill Gates, say that, you know, don't worry, we'll have clean energy sources by 2050. We'll be pumping out infinite clean energy. It'll be all cool. And I would like to believe that. I'd like to say to my friends in Bolivia, don't worry, we got this. We got climate change under control. Your glacier will be fine. We'll bring that back. We got an app for that. But the reality is, our faith that in green tech is distracting us from the political steps we should have taken yesterday to fix climate change. I found one of those staring at me right in the face, scrawling on the side of a boutique on Bainbridge Island. Buy less shit. The fact is, we, we in the industrialized world must consume less energy if we're going to have any impact on climate change. I consume 10 times more energy than my friends in Bolivia. And all the technologies in the world is not going to allow us to keep growing our consumption anywhere near current rates. At a rate of, two, of energy growth of 2.3%, which is lower than what we're at right now, we burn ourselves alive just from the waste heat in a little over 400 years. The fact is, we can't invent our way out of the second law of thermodynamics. I wish we could, but we can't. And believing anything else is at best a convenient delusion. But at worst, it's a stalling tactic that's going to get us all in here fried. So. For every problem that politicians, that people say there's a technological solution for, there's a political solution that would be probably much more effective, much more socially just, and probably more certain, easier, and more simple. Now, looking at that, I said, OK, well, maybe climate change, poverty, technology is not going to solve that. But you know what? I got some cool gadgets, and I am it makes my life better. And that's what we're told every day. But is that true? How much is technology making our lives better? Who is benefiting from technology? With that question in mind, I started to just kind of observe the industrialized world around me and think about the technologies I see every day. And I went into the grocery store and I, one day and I saw that they were pulling out all these fancy machines those, you know, those self-checkout machines that make you wish that you remember that a navel orange is 8623? First it was one, then it was two, then three, then it was six. They kept multiplying. Why was this happening? Was it, you know, I could just imagine my up in the supermarket HQ somewhere, the people getting together and saying, hey, this is a great way to save tens of thousands of dollars in costs and reduce the employee union's bargaining power. Machines, in case you didn't notice, don't ask for living wages. But what happened to those tens of thousands of dollars? And what happened to my favorite cheery checker when those machines came in? You see, technology like that improves our productivity, which is the amount of work we can do per hour. And that generates, that allows employers to do a lot more work with less workers. And that generates a lot of excess wealth that tends to flow up the corporate food chain, not down to the rest of us. If we were to really benefit from these productivity enhancing technologies, you and I would get a raise every time we got a technology that allowed us to do our job faster. Or at least we'd get some more time off. But you and I both know that we generally get neither. So when you look at productivity over the past 40 years, we can see that it's almost doubled. We produce almost twice as much per hour as we did in the 1970s. But our wages? Stagnant. We don't make any more money. 
And even though women have entered the workforce in record numbers in order to make up for, that, for our lack of buying power and to allow us to live out the American scheme and buy more stuff, we're no happier. We're no happier. So if you put that all together, you can see that we're being producing more, but we're not being paid more. We've got a lot more gizmos and gadgets, but we're no happier than people were when they were playing Pong and going to the disco. So, the, the productivity gains of technology in the last 40 years or so have mostly served to line the pockets of the 1% and destroy our natural environment in the process. But all that said, we can, we can put this all together and see that technology isn't really going to solve our biggest crises. And it's not really making our lives measurably better, even though it is pretty darn cool. Is that all to say, though, that technology won't be part of the answer to poverty or climate change? Absolutely not. Or that it can't make our lives better? Not necessarily. But if we want to make technology work for us to benefit all of us in this room, we're going to have to change everything we think we know about design. See, when I was in engineering school, they taught us that design was a pretty simple concept. It's the application of scientific principles to solve poorly defined problems with multiple variables. If only it was that simple, right? Design is a highly political act. The politics and values of the designer, owner, and society are literally coded, welded, and dissolved into the bits, bolts, and bases of modern technology. Take something as simple as a highway overpass. This is the Long Island Expressway in New York. Designed to Robert Moses' exacting specifications in 1958, this expressway has only nine feet of clearance. It's a little bit taller than me. But how tall are buses? They're 12 feet tall. And so that made this bridge, these overpasses, into a virtual gate that prevented the poor inner city residents from settling in or even enjoying the beaches of Long Island. Robert Moses' hostility to the poor, played out in concrete, had an effect far more permanent than any political legislation. And to this day, Long Island's wealthy suburban landscape sticks out like a sore thumb in a city where one in five residents suffer with poverty. As Langdon Winner brilliantly argued, the overpasses engineers designed served to quite literally widen the gap between the rich and the poor. Simple design variables like the height of an overpass can have profound political ramifications. And engineers make these decisions daily. They decide, should the bridge be stiffer? Should the beam, excuse me, be stiffer or lighter? Cheaper or more durable? Hand welded on site by a union contractor or prefabricated in China? The decisions we make are inherently subjective and they are subject to our bias and the constraints set down by the wealthy who own the process. And those constraints are necessary for design. We cannot design without constraints. We must know what is to be maximized and what is to be minimized in the optimal design. But that decision, what to maximize, that's an inherently political question. It's not a question of science. And so, If we want to maximize what really matters, we have a choice. We know that design as it currently stands is broken. We focus on profit and productivity rather than people. But if we want to change those variables, if we want to change what gets designed, how, and for whose benefit, we simply need to look back in time to see the people who have fought for, to change the variables already. At the turn of the 20th century, in the face of horrendous conditions across the global south, okay, excuse me, across the industrializing world, workers stood up and, and fought to make safety a real part of the variables that engineers designed for. And their struggles are something that we owe our lives to. But if the a collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, which killed over 1,200 garment workers last year, is any indication, that struggle is far from over. And even in the 1960s, we saw, and from then to now, 
the environmental movement pushing to make environmental impacts a bigger and bigger part of the variables that engineers consider. But if the constant collapse of ecosystems and the relentless march of climate change are any indication, that struggle is also far from over. So productivity trumps sustainability almost every time. Engineers are taught to maximize productivity over all other variables. But we can change those variables. And we already produce enough. We already showed that all the productivity that we have has not benefited you and I. We do not earn more money because of the productivity that we now have. And even if we did, there's nothing saying that that would make us any happier. Study after study show that more money doesn't buy more happiness after we meet our basic needs. And there's more than enough money out there. There's more than enough wealth to meet everybody's basic needs. The trouble is, it's concentrated in very few hands. The 300 richest people in the world have as much wealth as the bottom 3 billion. And the richest 100 people, they could end poverty with extreme poverty with what they earned in 2012 four times over. So the problem isn't a lack of productivity. The problem is a lack of fairness. Now, w I believe that we can change those variables. I believe we can change. But that doesn't mean that I believe that technology will miraculously make my life better or end the problems and end the suffering that I see in society every single day. I know that I cannot let technology and the f my faith in it distract us from what really matters, which is politics, even if it can help us a little bit along the way. I may have lost faith, my unquestioning faith in technology, but I have replaced it with a faith that is far more powerful, the faith in everyday people standing up for each other. And that's why I've become an activist. I believe, perhaps against all odds, that political change is absolutely necessary, completely possible, and already underway. But if we're going to make that change, if we're going to win, I'm going to need you to believe more in each other than in technology. Thank you. <laughs>